You're listening to Digital Now, an original business and technology podcast by Logic 2020. I'm your host, Matt Treville. Each episode, I'll be interviewing a new expert to learn more about industry trends, fascinating new tech, shifting customer expectations, and the steps every business can take to stay ahead. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the podcast. Today, I have with me two very special guests. First one, Evan Alkis is a strategy senior manager here at Logic 2020 and also our data privacy offering lead. Most recently, he has been focusing on operationalizing data privacy for organizations and creating holistic solutions for our clients and also is a new dad. Congrats, Evan. Thank you. It's great to be here. Nice, mate. Nice. Okay, second guest, uh, Eric Nelson. Now, you might re- you might remember this voice. Okay, as, as Eric is our second uh, second time guest here on the show, um, he's a director at Logic 2020, focusing on digital marketing strategy and operations consulting. He has been at Logic 2020 for 10 and a half years and has helped our clients to define their go-to-market strategies, customer journeys, and marketing technologies. Welcome back, Eric. Thanks, Matt. Good to be a long-time caller, a long-time listener. Yeah, um, yeah. I appreciate the emphasis you put on special um, because, you know, you're both very special to me as well. So I'm happy to have this chat. Today. That's so nice of you to say. What a great start this is to, to, the, to the episode. <laughs> all right. How about we jump straight into it? Because we could banter for two hours straight, but I, we need to get some questions answered here. Is that all right, gentlemen? It's perfect. Your show, Maddie. Well, I, that's not true. But anyway, okay. First question I got for you. Why is it important to consider data privacy when it comes to your digital marketing strategy? Well, I'll start and then I'll hand it over to Evan because I I think um, it's hard to not consider data privacy at this point in the life cycle and evolution of how things have gone. You know, I think we're, what, Evan, five years into GDPR, you know, three or so years into CCPA. We're seeing multiple states across the country add in their own different legislations to try to match some of the benchmarks that are in CCPA or stay behind it, as seems to more frequently be the case. Um, you know, and and I, I know Evan and I have talked about this a bunch, and we talked with a lot of our clients about the regulatory environment and the regulatory frameworks and how to match up with the regulations. Um, but our, our, our most leading edge clients and, and where we try to help folks go is moving beyond sort of that um, fear compliance based point of view. And, and looking at your operational perspective to understand how data privacy can become a competitive advantage. Um, we've seen lots of studies and lots of research on how customers prefer working with brands and organizations that keep their data secure. Um, customers don't like feeling weirded out. You know, uh, there's a, a old um, ad, ad agency owner who who I, I respect a lot, and, and he has one of those quotes, you know, a lot of times marketers fall in the trap of trying to extract information than provide information. And a lot of what we're, we're you know, trying to help focus on is using what information a customer is willing to share or a, a client is willing to share, things like that, to provide the best information possible so they can move through the next step of their customer journey. You know, there's all these things about not being creepy, not being weird, you know, but there's also just the tax that comes from, you know, sending somebody an unwanted email, sending somebody in an unwanted message. You know, you you take the, the classic example we see a lot where somebody buys a list and then tries to import that list and maybe didn't scrub it against their contact manager, didn't scrub it against their preference manager or, or other places. Um, and you send somebody an email that, you know, they don't know how, where they got it from. They don't know why they ended up on that list. It's not relevant to them. Then they put you on the unsubscribe list and you've lost the ability to communicate with that customer. You know, so you've, it's, it's about thinking about um, how you can best provide the information to the customer and move them in a way that supports your marketing journey rather than creating some sort of negative tax against it. Um, and if you start thinking that way, I, I think the regulatory environment gets a little cleaner because you're sort of operating within the intent of the laws rather than so focused on the letter of the laws. Um, and if you're always just trying to keep up with the letter of the law, you're always going to be behind. Um, you know, every every week we see um, 
Evan, help me out here. China recently, Canada's got some new stuff coming through, new stuff in the EU about um, data tracking across ad platforms and websites, Google killing cookies, like, you know, it, it's, it's, if you're just trying to keep up with the regulations, you, you will be behind, as opposed to being a leader allows you to take ownership of that space. And this is where we lean in with our data privacy methodology. It's operating to the highest common denominator, right? As Eric was mentioning, there's so many changing regulations, so many new regulations that are in committee, that are being reviewed, so on and so forth. But as an organization being leading, uh, leading in this market and putting the customer first and putting their customer's trust first, that is what we really push our clients to do. And that's where a lot of the, the organizations that are leading in this space operate to. I could read off statistics such as the, the Luxembourg DPA fined Amazon $888 million uh, because of their advertising targeting systems, things that Eric was leading with. In Luxembourg? In, this, in Luxembourg, yep. And just to, to hone in on the like the creepy component of the advertising nature, right? And there are so many studies that say the average cost of non-compliance is going to be around $14 million. That's including small and enterprise organizations, of course. But more importantly, that's the fiscal impact, right? Eric alluded to it. There are many studies that say 75% of consumers and customers won't buy or use from a, a company if they don't trust the company to protect their data. So what's that impact? to the top line? What's the impact to perception and everything else? It, it's so huge, but you don't have to be so finite in how you organize your organization in around data privacy. It's, it's just do what is right. Yeah. Evan, that, that comment about Luxembourg just floored me for a second. I'm sorry, because I, I, I think Luxembourg is what, like the size of Ohio, if that, you know, that's a that's a huge fine. Um, you have anyways. to always connect the, the anything we're talking about back to Ohio. Shout out to your home state, right? But yeah, it, it's absolutely incredible. And there's so many uh, cases and lawsuits and implications from a, a regulatory perspective. But again, that's only part of the puzzle, right? It's much broader than just the, that fiscal impact. It's interesting you're mentioning like it's basically coming from fear rather than doing it for the right reasons, right? Um, very interesting. So what is privacy uh, in digital marketing? And, and then what are some of the areas to watch? I know we spoke a, a little bit about it, but is there anything else we should mention? Yeah, well, I, I, I think to come back from what Evan was saying and, and connect a couple dots, a lot of the work we do in our, our marketing operations practice is, um, and even digital transformation is, is we look at connecting data systems and data flows to improve that customer experience. And most of what I, I like to talk about with customers, it's data privacy is an inherent piece of driving a complete and solid customer experience. You know, and, and we talk a lot about that, about how to best properly use this data and connect it. But, but one of the other most common things that we see, I, I remember a, a client we were working with a couple years ago and, and they were running seven concurrent email systems with different data being captured about the same person in each of those different data systems. And so you connect that back to one, a customer experience, which is, you know, how many different are you getting pinged from the same brand in three different places without the relevant knowledge of their other interactions? Are you actually doing anything to advance their purchase journey or repurchase journey or, or post-purchase support? Or are you getting lost because that data flow is getting stuck in one of those siloed systems. Um, so you've got a lot of those customer experience pain points, but then there's the other point, which is you're paying for seven systems and you're paying for duplicate data and duplicate systems and duplicate management and duplicate processes. And so all of those create friction within your business that not only creates different points that can have a data privacy exposure or a breach or a loss of other things like that, but you're also just straight up cost. I mean, that's hundreds of thousands of dollars of savings that you could reap by just cleaning up and getting into a centralized system, centralized privacy manager, centralized contact manager, that, that and then allows you to then build from that back into a more connected customer experience across those different silos. Um, and so, you know, that that's really, I think, where the, that sort of subtle mind shift over the last few years has been, if I'm a, if I'm a forward thinking organization, 
this opportunity with data privacy has given me, it's given me a lever to audit and restructure a lot of these systems that maybe got built up as a point system as a point in time and clean that up into a more central position that actually improves the customer experience. And it's an inter it's a good lever to have in, in, in those different conversations because ultimately that's what it's about. Data privacy is about creating that ultimate customer experience where that customer trusts you in the relationship. Yeah, that, that's absolutely well said. We have an example of uh, working with a retailer and working with their CIO, asking how many different uh, databases and systems is personal data stored in. And the answer uh, top of mind was around five. After doing kind of what Eric was alluding to, doing the analysis, doing the data flow documentation, there was over a dozen, right? And that is a lot of risk, only from uh, kind of the fiscal perspective, you're paying for redundant systems and tools, but also there's lots of hidey holes where people could be doing things that you don't know with personal data, right? And, and tying it back to kind of areas to watch, uh, as far as uh, digital marketing goes, I think the common thread or the common theme around all these regulations, again, operating to the highest common denominator, is there's something around consent and there's something around limiting secondary use of data. So it's all around giving them the option to not have or to not be tracked rather or it's giving them the visibility and transparency to, hey, if you use our services, this is what we're gonna do with your data. And if you don't want us to sell your data, fine, we won't sell it, but we still wanna use it for the internal purposes that give you a customer better experience, right? So I think it just ties to very simple, pragmatic things that anyone could do to make the, the right customer experience. So, so not that I was multitasking, but I did look it up. So there's about 650,000 people in Luxembourg, according to the 2021 estimate, <laughs> which puts it about one third the size of the Seattle metro area. Wow. And for those of you playing at home, <laughs> make sure you're jotting down your answers. <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you, Eric. And I'm sure there'll be more Luxembourg uh, facts coming up soon. But uh, OK, so. So how do you know about the regulations? Like, how does someone find out? And then, you know, what uh, what should the policies include? Well, I'll tell you what I do, Matt. I ask Evan. <laughs> well, that's a good policy. <laughs> that's a very good policy. I didn't yeah, know. no. I mean, there are so many ways that you could track and monitor the changing ecosystem and landscape. There are kind of privacy forward organizations like the IAPP, for example, that do a good amount of documentation and talking about what the upcoming regulations are. You can look state by state and understand their judicial system to see what bills are being placed and in review and you can do the the reading of what these reviews are uh, which is it's interesting to be able to look at but again it, it's very legalese and there's not a lot of impacts to the business unless you're able to to put on that finite analysis and determine this is what it is saying in legalese this is what it means for my business so again this is why we come at it from the perspective the highest common denominator and focusing on customer trust, it kind of makes everything a little bit more simple and less case by case. Um, but also with all these differing kind of states, um, there's a potential federal, uh, US federal privacy law coming in action. I just saw Salesforce is pushing for that federal law because it makes it a little bit more simple. GDPR in the European Union, there's a, a UK version of the GDPR. There's the PIPL, PIPL in China, and there's so many other ones, right? And it's understanding, okay, where do we want to be? How do we want to operate? And let's give everyone a universal experience focused on that trust, right? It helps you not have to customize, okay, Matt is logging in from uh, Seattle. So this is the experience that he's going to get to the future of Washington Privacy Act. And Eric's back at home in Ohio. So we're going to give him the Ohio experience, despite him being a resident of Washington. What's the implication of being cross state? No, just highest common denominator and act with customer trust. It makes everything a little bit more simple. It sounds like a good plan to me. You know, I'm sure Luxembourg could uh, take that on as well. Like everyone could do that, right, Eric? I, I think that's, a, you know, I, we'll, we'll keep coming back to that. It's it's you, where you can, you focus on the highest common denominator and, and then build up from there, right? And that's where you know, US, as everyone was talking about, you know, California has the, has the toughest 
regulation. And so if you're complying in California, you're basically complying in the rest of the country. Um, so there might be small tweaks here or there, but you can kind of know that that's sort of the, the same thing. Um, interestingly, I will also tell you that Luxembourg sells the most alcohol per capita in Europe. Very interesting. Thank you again, Eric. I look forward to the follow-up of this podcast where it's fun facts in geography between Luxembourg and Ohio. We can probably find some similarities, Eric, so I'd love to, to get a teaser by the end of this recording. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I will need to look up where the uh, the Luxembourgian population of Ohio found itself. I'm, <laughs> I'm sure there was a emigration at some point, as, as there often was. Um, I'm sure they're all but, Browns yeah. fans, too. Uh, unfortunately for them. <laughs> Anyway, uh, Eric, I'm going to ask you a question here, mate. What are some ways marketers can adapt to these new regulations? Um, I'm going to I'm going to hammer the he- hammer the theme hammer the theme, um, which is there. You it's a, leading to the highest common denominator and focusing on the customer experience that you want to build as a marketer. Um, don't necessarily focus too much on the regulation, but as long as you're focusing on improving that customer experience, um, most of the regulation is is set up to support that. You know, it's set up to say, we want to ensure that you've got um, systems in place for, for understanding tracking and data processing and all of those things actually can help you as you build out your systems and marketing plans because you have a better understanding a better audit of where data lives, where customer data is tracked, how to access it, how to use it for a campaign. Um, you know, there's there's a couple of the old older things that I think marketing in general and, and marketers in general have to watch out for, which is getting focused too much on a on a statistic or a benchmark and not a real campaign objective. You know, you used to see this a lot in in social media marketing. And, and so I pick on that a little bit. So uh, unfortunately, I f- apologize to all the social media marketers, but it's like, oh, I can get you 10,000 likes in two days. Like, sure, I, I give everybody a dollar and I bet you I could get 10,000 likes in two days. Then what? Then why? Like a like is not an endpoint. Somebody registering for your newsletter is not an endpoint. Um, buying a list of emails to then juice the email count in your distribution list is not an endpoint, right? Those are those are parts of a journey, and understanding how you convert people through the next part of the journey is what's important. And so, as a marketer, where you tend to get in trouble with some of the data privacy laws is doing things like purchasing an external list, but not being aware of the second level data pro- processing and data privacy laws that can impact that. Um, duplicate systems. Um, buying a list, not scrubbing that list against your unsubscribe list. So now you're spamming someone who's already asked for you not to contact them anymore. A lot of those things are just, you know, if you think about it, it's also a bad experience. You know, like you think of in our CRM, we have clients and and other people who have said, hey, don't contact us. Oh, that's fair. Um, Probably because I said something about Luxembourg I wasn't supposed to. Let's not contact them, you know, like that's okay. Or, or, you know, find a way, you know, that's a part of what a lot of these different rights and things are is, is building that right experience or, you know, and then you start to think of the next level things of like, if I know, you know, a customer of ours is a um, data warehouse architect, um, am I really going to want to send them a lot of articles about custom Java APIs? And it's not really in their wheelhouse. You know, that's going to be like a, Hey, this company isn't, they're not paying attention to me. They're sending me things that are unrelevant. I'm going to unsubscribe, right? So it's it's kind of moving that thinking away from like how big of an audience can I build so I can like push a message at them, right? It's not about you know as as um, as I mentioned earlier, right? Like what information are we giving as marketers rather than what information are we taking? And if we focus on giving good high quality information that connects us with the right customers for our brand, we'll be fine. And just to add really quickly to that, I think Eric is hitting at something very important. There's so many more channels in the the customer journey timeframe has extended far longer than it has before. It's from kind of the ideation and awareness all the way through purchase, post-purchase, but it's beyond that as well now. And one thing bringing it back to something that probably everyone has experienced is 
opting out of weird emails that you get from organizations. And I know my wife, for example, uh, bought a couch at a respective large brand um, company and was put into their email campaigns. She opted out a number of times and then said, hey, this is what you do often. Can you see if you can get me to opt out? And that's still part of the customer experience. It went to escalating to their data privacy officer of this organization and saying, hey, we've tried to opt out of your email services so many times, very bad customer support and service. Can you please remove us? And still that experience was very poor. So I'm probably extreme in this instance, right? Uh, But knowing that it's not just limited to a purchase. It's post-purchase. It's how you interact with them. What are the touch points and the check-ins that you have? How can you make that the best experience end-to-end and realize that customers have rights and they have things that they care about with their own protection of their personal data? So just be okay with that. Well, I mean, evidence to your point, like I'm, I'm sure that no matter how good the couch is at this point, you're probably not buying it again. No. Exactly. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Once you lose that trust and go through that experience, you're not going to have many people stay with you. All right. So last question. It sounds like throughout this, you know, the themes that are coming out of this, it sounds like you can be successful as a digital marketing person um, with the new focus on data privacy. Can you just reiterate again sort of how to be successful in this space? Yeah, I think you can be more successful, to be honest. I, I think it gives you an opportunity to... Um, reset some of the thinking in your organization and and think about how you can put a customer-centric journey and customer-centric view together of what you're trying to accomplish. Um, and so, you know, there, there's a couple things that I think we'll, we'll talk about, but there's always, you know, understanding that the, the highest denominator, you know, adhering to the most stringent language will get you there. Um, doing the audits and understanding of your different data warehouses, different data processing structures, so you understand where data lives, can clean up some of the duplicate systems, actually reduce costs, reduce churn, reduce a lot of those other things. And then third, um, thinking of how you actually create that customer experience um, to put privacy as an advantage for your organization. Yeah, I, I think Eric has absolutely nailed it. I will add to it that there is a short term and a long term to this, right? In the near term, sure, there might be some impacts. I know I was on a call with someone yesterday that was talking about the impact to their Google Analytics with cookie opt out. And they're saying, hey, so many of my users are disappearing, so I can't do the thorough analytics that we've been doing in months past. Yes, that is fine. We have to adopt to those micro changes and put into place what Eric was mentioning, those macro changes that could be a competitive advantage in the privacy space, in your customer space. The things that I will emphasize, again, Eric hit on most of them, I will say, if you just boil it down to that, again, highest common denominator, focus on transparency and putting the customers first, you, you've you hit a lot of the key points and the key concerns. So that is a really good starting point to be successful. I mean, yeah, it sounds... <laughs> It sounds pretty simple. Like, as long as you do those things, you'll be okay. And I know Eric is looking up some more Luxembourg's back <laughs> just before we say goodbye. Hey, Eric, have you got one more for us? I can see the smirk uh, on your face. <laughs> no, I, I will just say um, thanks to Andy and Frank Schleck, the two famous um, cyclists from Luxembourg. Um, and, and I hope if you stumble upon this podcast that, um, you know, thanks well, for listening. Them. But yes. then we'd be here, you know, that's my question. <laughs> anyway, I don't, I don't even know how to get away from this. Okay, uh, Jed, thanks so much for joining uh, the conversation today. Um, I think it's a very, very uh, important topic right now. And I hope that uh, people can take away some of those simple lessons that can, uh, that can be used to be successful. So really appreciate your time and uh, speak to you soon. You've been listening to Logic 2020's podcast, Digital Now. To learn more, visit our website at logic2020.com or follow us on social media. See you next time.